tenacious, and devoted to the collective good. As the Nobel Prize puts it, these scientists have conferred the greatest benefit to humankind. This is obviously a great day for Drs. Carrico and Dr. Weissman. It is also a great day for science. And the researchers the world over who are curious, inventive, tenacious, and devoted to the collective good. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Larry Jamison, Executive Vice President of the University of Pennsylvania Health System and the Dean of our Perlman School of Medicine. Dr. Jamison. Thank you, President McGill. Today is a day of enormous pride and excitement for Penn Medicine. The achievements of Dr. Weissman and Carrico have changed the course of history. Before Drew and Caddy's groundbreaking research, the potential for modifying messenger RNA for safe and effective medical treatments was daunting and uncertain. Their journey has been marked by scientific rigor and relentless perseverance, even in the face of skepticism. Since the rollout of the two mRNA vaccines in 2020, millions of lives have been saved and scores of others have been protected from severe disease, even in the face of an increasingly transmissible virus. Now, their pioneering work has opened the door to a new era of medicine. mRNA-based therapies have created a therapeutic platform for a wide array of diseases, infections that have plagued humankind for centuries, novel cancer treatments, genetic diseases, and more. Here at Penn Medicine, we are making breathtaking discoveries and we're putting them to work. We do so with a clarity of purpose, to serve the evolving needs of our rapidly changing world. This Nobel Prize is a testament to the transformative power of science and the spirit of innovation. It underscores the vital role that research universities like ours play in advancing knowledge and driving progress from the bench to the bedside. On behalf of Penn Medicine and the global scientific community, I extend my heartfelt congratulations to Dr. Weissman and Carrico. So we now turn it over to the two of you. Um, so I, I did not prepare any, anything to read, but um, I uh, came to University of Pennsylvania in 1989, and um, I worked here 24 years. At, uh, you know, it was wonderful at the beginning what I enjoyed, uh, the wonderful presentation because uh, we didn't have uh, YouTube and others and so only way I could hear great scientists that they come here and visited and uh, I could hear them talking and giving ideas and, and that was really wonderful. And, and of course in 1997 we met at the copy machine as it was in the written that and uh, maybe you have to have some more copy machine around <laughs> and go away and so the people can stand there and talk but um, uh, you know Drew came uh, from uh, NIH and I was already here in 1997 already um, eight years and working with doing messenger RNA things and I brag about uh, that I can do RNA and Drew was interested in vaccines, and that's how our collaboration started. We never worked even in the same building. We were in different building, different department, but we collaborated yeah. and had fun. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we worked side by side all, all of that time because we, we couldn't get funding, we couldn't get publications, we couldn't get really people to notice RNA as something interesting. It, it had failed clinical trials, and pretty much everybody gave up on it. But, you know, Katie lit the match, and, and we spent the rest of, I don't know, 20 plus years working together, figuring out how to get it to work, how to get a vaccine to function well. And COVID hit, and, and the vaccines were recognized for 95% efficacy, which was really a turning point in RNA therapeutics. 
we would sit together in 1997 and afterwards and talk about all of the things that we thought RNA could do, uh, all of the vaccines and therapeutics and gene therapies, and, and just realizing how important it had the potential to be. And that's why we never gave up. And, and we just kept persevering and kept working at it. And here we are today. Thank you. transition to our Q&A, and as I mentioned, we have some questions that have been submitted from members of the media. So our first question comes from Kristen DeGroot at Penn today. Where were you when you heard you won? Tell us about that experience this morning of getting those calls. I mean, uh, I get the first call, although they tried to reach uh, Drew, but somehow their telephone number did not work. So they called me up. Uh, it was uh, 3.40 or something very early, and my husband picked up the phone and talk to somebody and said, you know, this is for you. So he handed over the <laughs> telephone and, um, you know, was uh, said that, you know, me and Drew Weissman who received the Nobel Prize today and I was like, I didn't know whether it is real, you know. We suspected maybe some, you know, prank, yeah. yeah. Maybe, I, I don't know. <laughs> People report things like that. And anyway, so I, um, I also gave them uh, Drew's number, that too, you know, cell phone number, which you know, a week ago still was working. Yeah. <laughs> although, although at that time you didn't answer either. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that's how, how it happened. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, we get, Kate, Katie texted me and this got a cryptic message at four in the, the morning to Thomas Call. And I'm there, Thomas. So I, I, I Thomas texted who? her back and said, No, who's Thomas? And, <laughs> and she says, Nobel Prize. <laughs> And, and then I, I call her and, and we talk and she tells me about the, the message and they, they couldn't reach me because they had the wrong number or whatever. And we said, you know, th th this has to be a prank. Some, some anti-vaxxer is, 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 you know, playing with us and, you know, th this can't be real. Uh, but, you know, we, we sit back and we, we wait for the announcement and I, I, I FaceTime my older daughter who works in, in the medical uh, communications field. And she says, you know, okay, let, let's wait for the press conference. And we, we sat in bed and, you know, looking at my wife and my cat is begging for food. Uh, and we wait and the press conference starts and it was real. So then, th then we really became excited by this. Um, thank you. So the next question comes from Alice Park at Time Magazine. Did you expect to win a Nobel for your work so soon after its first successful application in the COVID-19 vaccines? I mean, uh, you know, we, we are not working for any kind of uh, award. It, we were just uh, having uh, some product. I, I mean, uh, last nine years I worked at BioNTech. And uh, the importance was, you know, to have a product which is helpful. and. Uh, so uh, I was uh, not thinking about uh, getting. Yeah, I mean, uh, t Thomas uh, a actually asked that question and said, <laughs> did, did you think it would be this quick? And I said, well, you know, I, I never expected my entire life to, to get the Nobel Prize, and it's an incredible honor. But no, I, w I wasn't expecting it this quick. And he said, yeah, we, 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 we kind of figured that was going to happen. but." That they said we, we wanted to be more current and we wanted to recognize things more, you know, usually it's nine years, I think, is the average after a big finding before they, they, they honor people with the prize. And he said we, the Nobel Foundation wanted to be more current and, and that's why, uh, and, and you were probably surprised that, that it was only three years and not nine after the finding. And who was Thomas? So, uh, Thomas Perelman is the executive vice president of the Nobel Prize organization, and he, he's who called us uh, with the announcement. Um, our next question is from Lauren Young at Scientific American. How can this mRNA technology be applied to other therapies, such as cancer immunotherapies, and where would you like to go next? 
Yeah, so th th this is something that, that my lab and, and Katie at BioNTech has been studying, and really the whole world. You know, everybody thinks RNA was invented in 10 months, but the, the, the first clinical trial was 1995, 96. Um, it's been around for a long time. Clinical trials with modified RNA started in 2018, um, and they've been going on ever since. We, we had three clinical trials going on before COVID hit. So th this isn't a new thing. And since COVID and all the attention, we, we've been able to tell the world about what we're doing. But we, we've got clinical trials for seven vaccines going on right now. We've got work on uh, cancer vaccines, vaccines for autoimmune diseases, for allergies. We've got gene therapy moving into clinical development. We've got a variety of therapeutics. So, you know, it, it's already been going on for many years, and th this has just given RNA the recognition. Yeah, so because actually 10 years ago was the first mRNA therapy meeting, and those, if you would attend every year, you would know that how many things already were, you know, in, in trial it started, and, uh, and uh, so, uh, CureVac is the first company, 2000, was established to develop a cancer vaccine. And uh, BioNTech uh, is an immuno-oncology company, not just for mRNA, but other things, but mRNA also was, 2012 was the first uh, cancer vaccine trial. So, and, uh, you know, as Sidhu mentioned, uh, for example, Moderna has for um, uh, heart failure, VGFA mRNA with AstraZeneca, they already started. and phase two trial was running, so everybody thought that maybe that would be the first approved yeah. product. So if uh, this pandemic would not happen, still we would have mRNA product, but it was, it accelerated. So the more money was poured in, and so that's why more product. So uh, two, more than 250 clinical trial yeah. ongoing on mRNA right now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Penn Medicine. So how did it feel to watch COVID vaccines roll out? So it, it was actually funny, and my, my family would yell at me about this. Um, a, after the phase one clinical trials, I was already working on other things and kind of ignoring the vaccine. Uh, we, we were working on pan-coronavirus vaccines and influenza and HIV and many other diseases. So I, 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 I sort of paid attention to the vaccine development but was worried, really focusing on what was next, what, what would be the future of RNA therapeutics. And that they, you know, my wife had to come and grab me and say, oh, they just released the phase three results and they were 95% effective. And I said, oh, great. You know, I, I was expecting 100%, but I, <laughs> I, I, I would accept, expect, you know, accept 95. <laughs> So I was working at uh, BioNTech, and BioNTech and Pfizer already signed up an agreement in 2018. Many people were not aware of to develop messenger RNA-based vaccine for influenza. And that was already, so we worked together. So it was not uh, when the pandemic happened that we met the Pfizer colleagues. And we were already ready to start human trial for influenza vaccine. So, but the, the mRNA uh, therapy is so simple that you have to change the template and then you, you know, you, you can get the new product because the RNA is always for, for nucleotides there. And uh, so that's why it is wonderful, not that uh, yeah. you can have multivalent because you can have uh, mRNA coding for many different proteins. You can put in the same uh, vial and inject once because otherwise with protein, they are, can be sticky or charged and you, they would get aggregation. But, you know, this is uh, simple with uh, Marani, but answering your question, so BioNTech started to work with Pfizer early on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this next question is for Dr. Carico. So you are among only a few women to receive a Nobel Prize in medicine. You know, what would you say for, or what advice would you have for other women making their way in science today? Yes, so um, uh, I usually 
when I have audience and maybe students, I usually tell them to find the right husband, first of all, <laughs> who is, uh, you know, supporting your dreams that, uh, you know, not serving you, but, you know, that realizing and helping you and, uh, and raise the child if you decide to have one. And um, so uh, I always mention that uh, mental and physical health is very important so that, um, you know, exercise and, and handle the stress. And uh, you have to enjoy. If you don't enjoy what you are doing, then you shouldn't do. So that if, I usually say, if you like the spotlight, then you should be an actor, an actress. <laughs> and uh, if you like to follow instruction, maybe military the best. If you want to be rich, I, I don't know answer for that, but if you like to solve problems that, uh, you know, science is for you. Thank you. Um, so this will be our last question. Um, and maybe we'll start with you, Dr. Weissman. Why should young people, so following on that, why should young people go into science today? No, I mean, nowadays, th there's really a dearth of young people wanting to go into science, wanting to go into academics, wanting to investigate. They, they want to do, you know, IT and become rich and retire or whatever. But for, for me, science is a place if you want to ask questions, if you want to say, can I understand things better? Can I investigate new things? Then science is the place for you. In order for our society to move forward, we need science. Everything that's moved our society forward in the past thousands of years has been science-based. The, the invention of the round wheel, the invention of transportation, the invention of antibiotics, of other medical therapies, all of that is science-based. So we need to encourage our children, our grandchildren, our neighbors, everybody, that science is what moves the world forward. And that's why it is so important. And it needs to be supported. And, and we need to get our children and, and everybody else to, to, to believe in it and to, 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 to follow it. Yeah. So, so you know that uh, we see in these days, you know, and maybe it's wrong, but you know, the, the young one day want the instant gratification constantly. Somebody is, uh, you know, uh, tapping their shoulder and uh, praising them, but um, you know, in science, uh, you know, is something that um, you don't get this one. You have to learn how to handle the failure because most of the time, you know, we don't understand, we make experiment, and the outcome is not what we want. And uh, so, but you can learn that, and uh, you can, uh, with the success, they usually say that with uh, after failure, with the same enthusiasm, you move on. And if uh, somebody likes to solve a puzzle where, you know, uh, some answer will be helping somebody to cure something. is It's just a so wonderful thing to do. And and uh, we emphasize, we worked hard, but we enjoyed. Yeah. Yeah? So that's what we have to reflect. Not, I mean, it's not coming easy, but it is fun, and we do it with great happiness. Thank so you. that's what I would say. Well, on that wonderful note, I want to say thank you to Dr. Kariko and Dr. Weissman, and maybe we can give them one more round of applause. today, both here in Philadelphia and those of you who are joining us virtually from around the world. Um, just a reminder that you can find updated information about our Nobel laureates on our website, including a recording of today's press conference, which will be, which will be available soon. So we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for being here. <laughs>